And hello, welcome back to the Film School for Marketers podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Zach Basner, and I'm joined by my main man, Will Schultz. How's it going, guys? We have a very special episode for you today, one that I'm super excited about. If you are looking at your video strategy right now, um, and you're looking at kind of what you need to do to adapt, uh, one thing that you might be curious about is we talk about they ask you answer content a lot, help content, but there's also other different types of content as well that can help you cut through the noise. And we're excited about our guest today because he's not only an expert video marketer, but he's surrounded by expert video marketers and they have one of the leading video marketing tools in the game right now. And we're joined by co-founder and CEO of Wistia, Chris Savage. Chris, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you for, for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's um, a few things that many of our listeners are probably familiar with that Wistia has done because they were almost like kind of disruptive within the, the marketing space. And that is two of your um, episodic series, one being Brandwagon. Yep. And the other one being 110. Hundred. One time one hundred, yep. Yeah, that series was I mean, people still talk about that. When you talk about episodic content, it's like what everybody thinks about. And what's interesting is that it's it, it, you're you're basically your own best case study at this thing that you refer to as brand affinity marketing. Yeah. So for those of us who aren't familiar with that concept, what what really is brand affinity marketing? Yeah, brand affinity marketing is it's you know it's it's something that we um, is a trend really that we saw happening of, of companies instead of just trying to grow their business with advertising or instead of trying to grow their business with like traditional content marketing where you're writing something that you hope will get indexed by Google and get you search traffic, you instead try to make content that is usually long form. Um, video shows, documentaries, films, podcasts where you're trying to get people to spend way more time with the brand. And if you have a really positive brand experience, they'll build more brand affinity. And that brand affinity means that they become, you know, huge recommenders. Um, they help you grow your audience for you. Um, they sign up at higher rates. Like it's, it's really trying to replicate the experience through content that usually you only get through a product, right? Like if you use a product and you love it, and then you have a problem with it, but you get really great support. And all those, uh, over time, you build this affinity. And at some point, you have this moment of trust where it's like, if anyone asked you, let's say it's like my Apple Watch, right? Like, love the Apple Watch. I've had problems with the Apple Watch. They fixed the thing. The new versions have come out. Old things have kept working. Like, I have a lot of affinity. Changed my, my health habits, right? Like, all of this stuff. So over time, it builds up a lot of affinity. So then at some point, someone starts talking about like fitness trackers or smartwatches. I'm an enormous advocate and tell everybody that they should be getting an Apple Watch and all the reasons why I was not going to do that on day one, right? Like I didn't have the affinity. And so this, this simple idea with marketing is like you're trying to build the affinity actually in the marketing, not just in the product. Yeah. So it's almost like versus just building enough trust to, to have buyers actually buy from you, but you've built trust so far that it's generated this level of loyalty that they're like spreading that trust around to the people they know. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's, it's that you build trust and loyalty. Um, and it's something that we just saw happening, right? Like 110, 100 was uh, huge for us. It was this like feature length documentary, right? About like we gave sandwich video in LA $111,000 and asked them to make three ads for us with different budgets. And then uh, one with a thousand dollar budget, one with a ten thousand dollar budget, with a hundred thousand dollar budget, and then we documented the creative process and ended up with this feature thing. And we did it because it seemed like a good idea. It was cheaper than their normal rates for uh, getting a video from them. It was like half the yeah. price, and like you know, it's this amazing opportunity to work with this company that we really looked up to. And so we're like, all right, we're going to figure it out. We're going to make this content. We'll have all these different ways that we could benefit from this project. Like the ads themselves could be good. The behind the scenes content could be good. We could run tests in the ads. It could be good. all this stuff, right? And it ended up having this impact that was really interesting, which was um, in the first two months that One Time 100 was out, there was more time spent with our brand from people watching that documentary than from everything we'd done in the previous 12 months. Interesting. And what happened was 
Um, it's like, if you made it three minutes in that documentary, it was such a niche niche thing. Like it was so focused, like the people who would care about this thing. Uh, if you made it three minutes in, you watched like the whole thing. And so people spent a huge amount of time with the brand. And then what happened is we saw direct traffic for Wistia go way up. We saw search for Wistia go way up. We saw search for 110, 100 go way up. And so actually a bunch of things that are normally pretty hard to track uh, because it was at this exact moment, we could see the connection and yeah. that like turn on the light bulb of like, wait a second, if this is happening for us, how, how has this worked for other people? So I just started talking to other companies. Like we talked to Envision that made this documentary called Design Disruptors, like maybe four years ago now, that was all about lifting up product design. And they had a very similar experience where they made this feature length documentary. Um, they actually, the only way you could watch it was at a private showing. You had to request access to see the documentary. Uh, and it had an enormous impact on growing the business. And the more I looked, I realized like that there's more and more companies that are just doing this. And they're, they're realizing that it's worth the investment in this type of long form content. Um, and that's what made us realize this is like actually like a, a pretty big trend to have. Mike. So when you're, when you're talking about this uh, brand affinity marketing, uh, like obviously it's cool to hear how it panned out very well for Wistia. What is the major problem that you feel like most SMBs are coming up against right now that this is going to help them solve for? Yeah, I think it's, I think the, the big problem is that it's, it's very crowded out there. It's very hard to know how to differentiate. Um, ads have gotten more expensive, although this the coronavirus is changing things a little bit. Uh, it's getting, you know, it's just hard to advertise in general right now. Um, and so it's this idea that like you need to find another way to break through and having a, 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 a very large loyal army will help you do that. It's, it's really interesting because if anybody's familiar with uh, uh, Google's content strategy of the hero help and hub type content. This is kind of like comparing um, hero content versus hub content or like episodic stuff. The hero stuff is really appealing. You know, it's like what most people think about when they think about video, it's like big brand videos and, and advertising these big projects. But obviously what we're proposing here is this kind of hero versus hub and, and that, that, that episodic is actually going to produce much longer term results because of this affinity and this loyalty that's being built. So for you know, any old, uh, I'd say any old, but for, for the regular SMB who is in, embarking on this journey, Chris, there's a series of steps that are outlined and we'll, we'll link up the, um, the ebook, uh, in the show notes as well. So people can check this out, but there's, there seems to be kind of a formulaic approach of a few steps that you have to go through to begin this type of journey. Can you walk us through some of those steps? Yeah. Yeah. The first one is you want to find um, the right niche audience to build content for. And so, um, you know, we live in such an interconnected world, like our entire culture is now an internet culture, uh, that I think we all expect when you look for information on any topic, like you'll find it, right? Like if you want to understand like how to turn your home into a smart home and you have an Apple TV, like there's an unlimited amount of content you can find around using HomeKit and all the lights. Like there's just an unlimited amount of stuff. And what ends up happening is that a lot of, you know, these connect, these communities that were disconnected in the past are now incredibly connected online, right? Like just go look at Reddit and look at all the subreddits for all the weird ass stuff that's on there. And you'll find these giant groups of people that are hanging out talking about these incredibly niche like little things. But in almost all those cases, like whether it's on Reddit or it's in um, Slack communities or it's in iMessage or WhatsApp uh, or Signal or wherever, um, these little communities, these niches are hyper connected, but they're often hard to advertise in. Like, so you have to find a way to like enter into that conversation. So what you want to do is find a niche that overlaps with your business. And, um, once you start thinking about like what products would this niche use and all this kind of stuff, you can start thinking about the second step, which is like, what content can you make that is actually binge worthy that that audience will actually want to like binge listen to or binge watch that if you can if you can nail it for them, they'll spread it for you. They'll bring it into their communities. They'll bring you past the wall. But, you know, they'll you won't have to advertise, um, and it's your your inroad basically to start to build your own audience. Chris, I'm curious from Wistia's perspective of doing this, <clears throat> and this is what I see people mistake most often is they don't go niche enough, 
Did you guys ever have to sort of re-niche or go even further down a rabbit hole when you were looking for this ideal group for your own hub content? Or did you have to pivot away from something that you thought was going to make sense that didn't actually generate your, your organization revenue? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great point. I think people don't get focused enough and they get afraid, right? Like you start making something and you're like, oh, I'm going to make this for everybody. And that inherently means it's for no one. And um, so, yeah, we've, we've had, it's the classic story of like, we ended up starting with like really, really focused stuff and then you get more confident. And so you go wider and wider and you're like, wait, why isn't this stuff working? And then you're like, there was a moment where we had to double down. It's happened a couple of times, double down on getting hyper-focused. And so we think about it for us as like a few different, um, a few different groups that we're going after with the content. And, you know, we have some shows that are for one group um, and content that are for other groups, but the idea is to make it incredibly, incredibly focused. Yes. What's interesting is, so the, the audience for 110, 100, um, the, the statement in this ebook says people who wish they could do big creative marketing. That, that's, a, that's a tribe of people, but it's not necessarily, it's not something basic, just like people who are really passionate about video. Like it speaks to a, 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 an emotional level to, to this audience that they wish they could do this big creative marketing. I think that's like really a key in helping any business apply this. It's just like, what is the major problem and the thing they're emotional uh, about that's going to draw them in? Not necessarily would they identify as a you know, super fan of what you do. That's a great point because that actually was, we were very clear when we realized who that was for, that it was not just for video producers, right? Like there's a lot of video producers who want to see inside sandwich. There's also a lot of just like creatives that work at ad agencies. There's a lot of people in marketing roles who are really close to the production that wonder how it worked. And so it was a way for them to see inside. And then there's people who like, just like crave uh, behind the scenes creative content and they could be in any job role. And I think it's like actually one of those funny things that like the job title is not as helpful because like you can have a VP of marketing who is like, really into uh, the creative side of things and really into like weird internet stuff. And you can have another VP of marketing that's just really into data. Um, and you can have another one who's like only does in-person events. And if you go, if like you can have 50 different VP of marketing like um, targets basically. And so yeah. it's actually like you need to cut through. So there's like five of them that are going to love it so much. And there's a ton of people who aren't actually in the job that are recommenders or people who are close to that person or whatever, that would be a really good fit as well. And I think, yeah, it comes back to like what people's actual interests are. It's like an admission that like uh, work and life is pretty intertwined. I mean, now it's insanely intertwined, but normally it's like, um, you know, there's a lot of people who listen to podcasts that are around the topic that their job is on the way to work because they just like learning about it. Like that's just mm -hmm. how it, this is the world we're in. That's really interesting. Like the, the, the subculture that you identified, it, it might include people who wouldn't typically think that, that they are in a tribe together, right? So these people, these big ad agencies maybe wouldn't typically identify with video producers, or something like that. So it's, over, it's overlapping into a lot of different areas. So once we've identified our tribe, we've identified the, 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 you know, the audience, the subculture, what's the next step with this? So obviously you're going to be making the content. Um, and I think like figuring out just like this show, like what's a good format, um, what's a format that's repeatable. And I would bet for you guys with this show, like the more you do it, the easier it is to actually do the production of it and the more confident you are in like how it's going to fit together. The same thing with your audience is one of the magical things about, um, shows that have a consistent format is like, if it resonates with the audience, they help you grow it, right? Like they tell other people who are going to find it really interesting. And so the longer you're at it, the more you do it, the better you, the better you get at it. Um, and then the next piece is like, we call it marketing like a media company. I think we've heard a lot of people say like, you should act like a media company. And like, you know, what we mean is, um, you have to actually think of the content as a product. And so when you think of the content as a product in and of itself, not just as like a means to a different end, but you think of it as like, there is value in this podcast. There's value in this that someone hopefully will listen to this and do something differently than they would otherwise. Um, you can start taking clips from this and promoting it and, and you can start marketing the show itself. And so if you look at what media companies do, they'll end up with, you know, 
they'll end up with a show that has tons of divisible content in it. So they'll have clips that make sense that can be sent out on their own into different social platforms. They'll do PR about the shows themselves. They'll do ad campaigns. They'll do trailers. They'll do all this. There's ad, when you think of it as a product itself, just like with your other products, um, whether they're digital or physical or whatever, like you make ads and you do PR and you write behind the scenes and you do all this different stuff. You can actually do the same stuff for media content. And when you start doing that, you start acting like a media company. And uh, the, the thing that's exciting about it is when content's long form, people are willing to receive advertising about it. Like if I'm advertising a three minute video and I have av- and my ad is a minute long, it's going to get pretty annoying pretty quickly. Like there's no variance in the content that I'm seeing. Um, it's like, why didn't you just show me the whole thing? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, but when you have longer form stuff and it's an admission that, you know, it's a commitment. So if someone's never listened to this podcast before, they, they're like, they don't know to listen to it unless someone recommends it to them, which hopefully that you've built that tribe and they're, they're, they're recommending it. But if someone might be interested, they don't know it exists. You start pulling out clips. You put those clips on social, you put those clips into ads, you start doing PR around the, the show itself. Suddenly someone's in a different context. They're like, wow, this sounds, this sounds like a big deal. This sounds like something that might be worth my time. And what you're trying to do is get them in that, in the door to try it, you know, try listening to the first episode or the most recent episode or whatever, and then become a subscriber. And, and then the magic, the magic happens. Yeah. And Chris, this leads me to the second biggest question I had for you just out of pure curiosity is when, with your featured link doc, what did, where did you find the most traction of repurposing that and, and giving it sort of new life that it didn't just see at the premiere or, or other ways of repurposing it? You know, really simply. Uh, so it's funny. We did we naturally, <laughs> you, when you end up with a documentary, you're like, okay, so we try to make a trailer. So you make the trailer. And then we're like, well, should, how long should the trailer be in market first? Like, cause even people knowing that we made a documentary is probably good for us. So like, why don't we start advertising the trailer? So we started advertising the trailer, maybe like two months, six weeks before the documentary came out. Sure. So now you have six weeks of promotion for a piece of content and people keep seeing Wistia did this thing. And it's like thinking about this thing. Then the documentary came out and we kept the trailer market. Um, it kept advertising. And we, we were also able to do a lot of PR because we had uh, people who were excited that, to hear about the concept in the first place and like saw the trailer, watched the documentary. So we did like kind of an inter- interview tour. Um, and then the, the crazy thing was that even, it probably was like four months or so that we were in market um, maybe a little longer, actually five months where people were like really heavily, like sharing the documentary and what have you. And then we're like, there's a lot of people probably that still don't know it exists. Who would care? Should we just keep advertising and see what happens? And we did. And it kept working. Like it, that was the, one of the craziest parts was just like, uh, because the content is so long form and we knew at that point that it was actually good because it was, you know, people had watched it and told us that versus us like, you know, wasting tons of money on something bad, which I've also <laughs> done that as well. Uh, it just, it, it has a life of its own. And so even now people still watch it every week. People are constantly watching it. It's on the site. Yeah. People watch on Amazon prime it has a lot of organic traffic now. And so it just like built up this thing over time. Um, and when it comes up, when other relevant things come up, you can throw it out there and say, you know, there's someone's talking about like some new tech uh, in the video space and why budgets are changing. Then you just can kind of be like, oh, is this helpful and relevant here? And it usually, it usually is. Yeah. And I imagine there's a bulk of the, the, the viewership that watches this because of like trigger events in their own professional jobs. Like they were given X amount of budget to go at like a director of marketing of a smaller mid-sized business that all of a sudden is trying to wrap their heads around the video production world and what were their dollar per um, goes for, for what the budget of the content is going to look like. And that person may not need it until five years from now when they're tasked to do this, but it's still going to really be important for them to watch that thing. That's the idea. I think it's really interesting, Chris, how th- this thought of treating the content like it is a product. And uh, the reason I think it's very interesting is because you wouldn't go and start marketing a, a new product of yours until it was a complete product. I think one thing that we can take from the the documentary application is that the documentary was done and it's easier to market and talk about it when you know what it is. 
one mistake that I think a lot of businesses make, especially when it comes to things like podcasts, is that they just start producing a podcast and they're really not, it's not, it's not a product yet. It's not a complete thought. It's not a complete thing. And so how do you market it when you really don't know what it is? So this idea of looking at it like a product is really going to make it easier to market just the way that you would market any of your products or services. That's right. That's exactly right. I think the other thing that um, we, we learned this one with, with uh, a brand wagon more, I would say than with one to 100, but um, is when you treat it like a product, you interview the customers. So you just mm-hmm. like talk to the people who watch it. You talk to people who listen to it and you're like, what do you like about this? What don't you like about this? Why would you watch it more? Why would you, why would you watch it less? Like, and it's again, we guess what media companies do. They have, you know, focus groups and all these people trying to understand like why things are taking off or why they're not. And I agree with you on the podcast side. Like it's almost too easy to make your first episode. So a lot of people make like two or three episodes. And I'm like, well, I guess it's not working, like not going anywhere. Like, well, if you built something, you know, if, if you had like a web app and like three people saw it or a hundred people saw it, you didn't talk to them about how it was going and they didn't come back, you'd have just no idea what was going on. You just, you, if you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put yourself in that position. And so I think, or try not to. And I think it's like another piece of the puzzle is like actually asking me like, what do you like about this? I mean, crystal clear. I think to your point, if you're going to do a podcast, make sure you can do enough episodes. You're going to do it for long enough that so you can get the feedback. There's a reason why it's different and why it should exist and why it makes sense for your audience. And like that you, you, you know, figure out those things up front. It's going to make a really big difference in terms of how long you can keep investing and learn. On that same, um, that same thought of measurement and, and seeing what, what works and what doesn't, the step four of the, the brand affinity marketing playbook is measuring resonance over reach, which is a little different than how we measure a lot of things, especially yeah. when it comes to video. So talk yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's just looking at like when you're trying to, you know, relationships take time to build. And that's the fundamental idea of this brand affinity thing is like people will build affinity over time. So what it makes sense to track like how much time is spent with your brand. Um, so how much are they listening? How much are they watching? And then um, the other, the other things you want to look at are the indicators of the strength of the, of the brand or the strength of the sub brand that you're building. So um, you know, how much search traffic are you getting with this stuff? Um, how many referrals are people making from this stuff? Like all of the kind of like stuff that shows you that someone is a loyal audience member versus just page views. And of course, if done properly, the resonance is what you see in the short term. Um, and over time that builds your reach, right? So like you're building an audience. So your number, you're not saying, it's not that you'll never res- like you'll never measure reach or care about how many people are watching or listening to your stuff. It's really just like, it's so critical at first, I think, to look at like um, those, those indicators to show you how, how loyal somebody is. And then the other thing you can look at in terms of getting, and you have to have enough, you know, enough people in your audience for this to matter. Like if there's a small number, it's not going to matter. Um, but you can just look at the, the behaviors of people who actually interact with the content. So like what I mean by that is in our case, we looked at people who, uh, for all our content, we've looked at things like stay on the brand wagon thing if someone watched an episode of Brandwagon, how does that change their behavior if they have not signed up yet for the product, if they have signed up for the product, if they're trialing the product, or if they're actually a customer? And looking at things like expansion, churn, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it makes sense. But one of the things that we've seen, um, and we've seen in market with lots of other companies, uh, MailChimp has seen this, and they're at enough scale with their approach that they can, they can really see it, is that basically if the content resonates with the audience, it's the right type of content. Um, they'll see much higher conversion rates for people who watched like on mail, MailChimp has this whole part of their site called MailChimp presents, which is all this like mm-hmm. wild and insane content that's designed to, uh, inspire small entrepreneurs. And they've seen that if someone watches these crazy shows and movies and stuff that they have, um, and then they go sign up for the product, they convert it at a higher rate. Or if they're an existing customer, they churn at a lower rate. And yeah. it's really like, those are things that are measurements of like, well, yeah, if someone recommended a product to me and told me it's really great, I'm probably going to plow, plow through and, and like look over some of the, the things I don't understand or challenges and just sign up. And so it's, it ends up having that effect, which is, you know, super powerful, but you have to have enough 
you have to have enough of the audience there to be able to actually measure it. That's really interesting because, you know, a lot of decisions that are made in with any kind of sales or marketing initiatives, but especially with video, it's like there has to be a somewhat of a definitive ROI. But with this, there's like a lot of work that goes in initially. And then the ROI comes after you might not have, you, you might not be able to measure the outcomes, uh, but measure the inputs first. How yeah. I'm, I'm curious, how did, did you guys at Wistia immediately start measuring kind of this ROI as these series were going out? Or was it more of an approach of like, we're going to build up this audience and then try to convert them? Or how did that work? Yeah, so you're exactly right. I mean, I think this is definitely a long-term approach, right? Like it's the type of thing that like, if you're looking for really short-term results, like you might get them, but you're probably not going to have like massive short-term results. And I think when if you set up for that, um, and you understand that, then tons of companies invest in this type of thing all the time. It's just they don't take 100% of their marketing budget and do it, right? Like you're going to start mm-hmm. with some smaller portion, um, but usually, you know, you build it up over time, then you can see it. So for us, yeah, it was like we knew with, with any big piece of content that we've done, uh, we've always looked at the qualitative stuff first. Like I, I feel like that's just like a general lesson of life is like, you can get 10 pieces of feedback that are qualitative and understand something's good. But if you had 10 pieces of quantitative feedback, it'd be, you would have no clue. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's just that simple thing of like talking to people and asking them questions. And so with 110, 100, for example, it was like, all right, what are people saying on social? What are, can we get articles written about this, about this thing? Like, uh, are there comments coming in? We asked everybody in sales and support. We're like, are you, if you're hearing about one to 100 at all, just like, let us know. And in that case, we're very fortunate and it's pretty instantaneous that like people started writing it. Like the sales conversations were happening. And so I'd be like, oh, and I just watched one to 100. So awesome. Like blah, blah, blah. And then they, you know, connect them to someone on the team or do whatever. Um, and it seemed clear pretty quickly that the qualitative feedback was there. And so that made it even easier to invest harder, uh, to invest more when that stuff was beginning to happen. And then that helped us get to a place where it was like very easy to see quantitatively that, that it was beneficial. We're obviously going to link up Brandwagon and 110, 100 in the show notes so people can check that out. And I imagine there's probably a bunch of examples in the ebook that we'll link up as well. But if you were going to recommend a few other companies who you think have done this really well, are there any other series that you would recommend our viewers and listeners go check out to get some inspiration on this? Yeah, I think one of my, my favorite companies to recommend is ProfitWell. ProfitWell has um, a product that lets you track like all your fundamental SaaS metrics. Mm-hmm. So you like hook it up into Stripe or Chargeify and it shows you like all your fundamental metrics. Um, and then they have a bunch of other things that they help people with, with pricing and uh, pricing testing and stuff like that. And they have built like a really impressive media network of content, um, daily podcasts, video shows, like tons and tons and tons of stuff. And um, I think they've done just an incredible job of this. And one of the things they've done that's so amazing is they figured out on the production side how to make it much more affordable to create this type of content. So they have this show called The Pricing Page Teardown where they just have two folks talking about people's pricing pages and they go and they run studies on different companies pricing and then try to figure out if they price properly or not and what have you. I think each episode is maybe like four or five minutes long, uh, features a different company, has like, you know, a guest who asked a question and they figured out how to shoot the whole thing in a day because they do one setup um, for all the, the two main people are in the same setup the whole time. And they do a bunch of prep and hard work to like produce the episodes and get ready to go. And what it means is that from a production perspective, in one day they can shoot 10 weeks of content. And so it makes the whole math like upside down. You know, it's like cheaper for them to make a, a season of that show than it is for them to outsource an ebook at this point. And um, I think that's just like a, a phenomenal example of like doing this in a really scrappy, interesting way. Another example of a company that's doing it really well is MailChimp, which I mentioned earlier. They took 100% of their brand advertising budget in 2019 and put it instead into making and promoting content. And so they've been buying up the rights to existing movies. They've been doing wild stuff. And one of the crazy things about MailChimp's content is it's incredibly far removed from the brand. So like ProfitWell, you know, SaaS metrics pricing stuff like seems pretty close. MailChimp, we know what MailChimp is, but their content is like, 
you know, documentaries about these like these like cowgirls who live out west and are like trying to figure out what their next business is going to be. They have this documentary they bought the rights to called Hands on a Hard Body, which is a documentary. Have you heard of that? So the documentary from the 90s, it was like a competition to see who could keep their hand on a car the longest. And whoever did that won the car. Ah, oh, okay. And it seems pretty far removed from MailChimp, right? Yeah. Um, and yet it, it works. And one of the reasons it works is like, you know, what types of podcasts or shows would MailChimp have advertised on? Like they advertise on cereal that has nothing to do with small business. And yet it was incredibly effective. I think we forget that we advertise on stuff that's like not very relevant usually to our businesses, especially if we're spending a lot of money on advertising. And so you can have content that is, as long as the, the brand values and the content align with like the same brand values you're trying to get across in your ads, you can actually go wild with stuff. And I think MailChimp's a, a great example of that. All right. So Chris, we'll make sure and add in those, um, all these examples so people can check them out really easily. If Chris, people want to keep in touch uh, with you, see what you've got going on, see what is going on at Wistia, where should they go? Where should they opt in? Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at C Savage, uh, or you can check us out on Wist. You know, all the contents on there, all the playbooks, all the stuff. Um, yeah, those are, those are the best spots. Nice. We'll make sure and include all that, Chris. We really, really appreciate you spending some time with us today. I'm sure all of our viewers and listeners are going to get a lot of value out of this, and we appreciate you, viewers, as well. So thanks for tuning in with us once again on the Film School for Rutgers podcast. Be sure that if you have any questions, drop those down in the comment section below. Like this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you haven't done so already to the Film School for Marketers podcast. Tune in next week for a new episode. Until we see you next time, keep learning.